we'll see if it works. <laughs> young parents, especially, usually the young lady just cannot wait till she becomes a parent. Some of the things that they think about are this. I just can't wait to have that little bitty baby in my arms and see those loving little eyes just looking up at me. They think about this. I will have someone to love and I will have someone who's going to love me beyond measure. And then the baby is born. And oftentimes parents think this thought. What in the world have we done? You see, all the positive things are still there, aren't they? That little baby, you get to hold that little one and rock that little one, and that little one puts his head up against you and goes to sleep, and oh, so precious. And yes, you do have a little bitty baby who loves you beyond measure, and you can love that child beyond measure, but there is problems. And those problems oftentimes are coming out of both ends. And for some reason, this little baby just does not like to sleep. And for some reason, this little baby just does not stay healthy all the time. For some reason, his ears are red. For some reason, his nose is running. For some reason, I'm constantly having to take this little one to the doctor. And then he gets to be about two or three. And he's into this and he's into that. And Tupperware is everywhere around the house. Toys are everywhere. My commode is constantly clogged up with something. I'm always wondering, where, where did he go? And then he becomes a teenager. And he's mouthy. And he's lazy. And he's irresponsible. And he's defiant. And all of a sudden, parents find out that Parenting is work. Folks, what we want to talk about this morning is the work of parenting. There is supposed to be a PowerPoint lesson with this. And I have no clue whether that lesson is going to show up or not because it has not as of yet. <laughs> so we will preach, okay? The work of parenting. Folks, what I want to do is this. I want to talk about six components of parenting which are involved in the work of parenting which if parents will implement these things, hopefully, hopefully they will make your job easier and not only easier but also when your child is finally grown and having children of his own, you can look back and say, you know, I did a good job as a parent or I see some success in what I did while my children were growing up in my house. Point number one, all parents need to do everything they possibly can to parent with God. As I thought about that point, there were two things that came to my mind. Number one, God is the one who created that little bitty baby, is he not? When we turn to Psalm 139, we read these words. My substance, when my substance was formed in secret parts, thou knewest it. Folks, God was involved when that little baby was first conceived in the womb. When that little egg and that mother was fertilized by the father, the very moment that those two things joined together, there was life. And it was at that very moment that God was deeply involved in the process. He saw the entirety through those nine months of development in the womb. He knew everything there is to know about what was happening, what was transpiring, the personality, everything that was being given to that little baby. God knows your child better than you do. But secondly... It was God who created the home, was it not? In Genesis chapter 2, verses 18 through 24, we find that God 
is the one who instituted that home. It was he who brought a, man, a woman to the man. It was he who formed that home and commanded them to be fruitful and to multiply. So think about that. God is the one who created my child. God is the one who has created the institution into which my child has been born. Surely, surely every one of us ought to be individuals who want to parent with the Almighty God. I believe this, that unless a parent parents with God, it is impossible to truly say he is a good parent. Oh, some individuals may raise responsible kids. Some individuals may raise children who are wonderful citizens of the United States. They may go on to do wonderful things. But my friend, life is longer than just this life, is it not? Individuals are going to die. Those children are going to pass from this life. And it is at that point that my parenting with God becomes essential, isn't it? What does it mean to parent with God? Boy, we could do an entire lesson on this one point. Point number one. If an individual is going to parent with God, they need to make certain that they teach their children that God is real. And that that child can have a real relationship with the Almighty. Folks, God is not just some concept to believe in. God is a real being. He is a real personality. When you turn over to Genesis chapter, or Genesis chapter 5, verses 24 and 26, the Bible says this, Enoch walked with God. Enoch walked with God. Genesis 6, verse 9, Enoch walked, or Noah walked with God. Can you imagine here God is residing in heaven, and yet these two men are doing what? They are walking daily with their God. They are in an intimate, close relationship with a real being in heaven. Somehow, we've got to get our children to understand that there is a real God. And they can get close, intimately close, with the Almighty God who resides in heaven. Point number two. You and I need to teach our children the precepts and the principles of God's Word. In Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 6 and 7, And these words which I command thee this day shall be in thine heart, and thou shalt teach them diligently unto thy children. It is a parent's responsibility. To make certain that the Word of God is deposited into the hearts of their children. Folks, it's not the church's responsibility to do that. Oh yes, we can assist. But it is not front and center for the church to make certain that your child learns the Word of God. That is the responsibility of parents to teach their children what God demands and what God expects of them from His Word. Teach your children the Bible. Point number three. It's one thing to teach the precepts. It's another thing to teach those children how to apply those precepts, is it not? The Bible says, Be ye doers of the word, not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. James 1, verse 25. Parents must, not only while teaching the word, they need to stop and they need to say, now look, this is where you can apply this particular teaching of God's word to your life. When certain scenarios and situations arise, those parents need to take those children aside and they need to read scripture to them and say, this is where this passage of scripture applies right now on this particular occasion. Folks, we need to teach them exactly what we mean when we say, this is how to apply God's word to your life. Point number four. We need to teach our children how to do some harmonization of their knowledge of the Word of God with the worship of the church and with their service to the Almighty God. You see, individuals have a tendency to categorize all of these things, to pigeonhole all of these things. Knowledge is one thing, worship is another thing, service is another thing. That's not the case. 
My knowledge, my worship, my service should permeate everything that I do. It is Joshua who said, but as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. You see, I've got to teach my children how to serve the Almighty God. It was Jesus who said, God is a spirit and they that worship Him must worship Him in spirit and in truth. John 4, 24. We come together on Sunday mornings and we worship a certain way. We'll partake of the Lord's Supper every first day of the week. There are no instruments of music that we use here. We will be involved in prayer. There is a lesson from the Word of God. We will give of our means. And the question is, why? Why do we do all of those things? Just because this is Church of Christ tradition? No. It's because the Word of God declares this is how God desires to be worshipped. It is not something that's made up by man. It's not something that we just do because we like it. It's not something we do because it feels good to us. This is what God has demanded of us. Folks, we've got to harmonize God's Word to worship and service in the lives of our children. Fifthly, our children need to understand that this book applies to every area of their life. Every area. According as the divine power hath given unto us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of Him that hath called us to glory and virtue. Folks, we've got to teach our children that God's Word has the answer to every problem, every difficulty, every struggle, anything that we possibly face in life. There is something God has written. There is something God has revealed about that matter. Nothing of our life is left to chance and left to our own whims and thoughts. What does God have to say about this? And somewhere in there, we can find it. There's a sixth point that I thought about, and it was this. We need to teach our children about the joy and the riches of a knowledge of God's truth. The law of thy mouth is better unto me than thousands in gold and silver. That's found in Psalm 119, verse 62. Let me ask you something, parents. Is that really the way you feel about the Word of God? I'd rather have this book and what's contained therein than thousands in gold and silver. When your, when your children watch you living your lives, is that what they believe? That the Word of God is more important to my parents than thousands of gold and silver. The psalmist said, I rejoice at thy word as he that findeth great spoil. Psalm 119, verse 172. Can you imagine an army winning a battle? And they go into the camp of the enemy in order to find the spoils. In every tent, they find great stores of ammunition. They find all kinds of food supplies. They find all kinds of riches and wealth that this army has brought with them. They recover every bit of their arsenal. They recover all of their animals, whatever it is that they brought to the battlefield. All of it is mine. Would they rejoice? The psalmist said, I rejoice at, that, at thy word more than he that taketh great spoil. Folks, what we find in the word of God is valuable. What we have in the word of God is more precious than anything you and I could possibly imagine. And our children need to learn that. This is not a dull, dry, boring book. It is not simply a book given to mankind to limit his actions on this earth, to keep us from being individuals who are free and happy. No, God gave it to the benefit of man, and it is rich, and it brings joy to the heart of man. Our children need to be parented with God in mind. Point number two. As parents, parents need to parent with knowledge 
Hosea from the Old Testament was right. My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. So oftentimes we parent without much knowledge, don't we? We just all of a sudden have a child and about the only knowledge that we have about anything hardly is our knowledge that our parents gave us and the way they reared us. And so we just do a lot of repetition, folks. Parenting involves a ton of knowledge if the truth be known. First of all, there is a knowledge of the Word of God that you and I must acquire as parents if we're going to teach our children, aren't we? One of the reasons many children are not taught is because the parents don't know very much to teach. That's sad. Secondly, parents need to know their children, don't they? You see, every child is different. And it still blows my mind that three or four or five or ten children can come from the same mom and dad and be so different. How does that happen? I don't know. But every one of them are different, aren't, aren't they? You've got to know a little bit about their personality. You've got to know a little bit about their likes and their dislikes. You need to know something about their flaws and their weaknesses as well as their strengths. And you have to parent based upon that knowledge of that child. There also needs to be a little bit of knowledge about parenting skills. And boy, we could go into a long list of those, you know it. One of the best skills that anybody could ever learn is the ability to listen. Now notice I didn't say communicate. Because see, communication involves backwards and forwards processing. But one of the skills under communication skills is the ability to listen. We don't do that very good. And parents sometimes are the world's worst. If you don't believe it, ask their children. Does your mom and dad listen to you? They just laugh. Are you kidding? But it's a skill we need to acquire. And here's what's interesting. You can take course after course after course about how to listen. And guess what you still can't do? Listen. I promise. Counselors, trained to listen. Get in a marriage, can't listen. Counselors trained to listen. Get in their own home with their own children, can't listen. If you don't believe it, go ask my wife. She'll tell you, he can't listen to nothing that I say. Sometimes she'll tell me, put on your counselor skills. Oh, drives me crazy. <laughs> Folks, listening is one of the hardest things that individuals do today. And it's one of the biggest hindrances of our personal relationships. It's amazing. So we need to practice and learn some skills as parents. But we also need to have some knowledge, do we not, of the evil of this world and how to protect our children from all the evils that are transpiring. And folks, every day it is getting harder and it is getting worse for Christians. And you and I are going to have to be individuals who can equip our children to stand against what's about to come in the United States of America. And it is not going to be pretty if it continues down the same course it has gone for the last several years. The Bible says, by wisdom is a house builded. And by understanding it is established. And by knowledge shall its chambers be filled with all precious and pleasant riches. Proverbs 24, verses 3 and 4. Wisdom, understanding, and knowledge. The inspired writer says those things are a must if a house is going to be built, established, and filled with riches. My friends, we must parent with knowledge. Point number three, you and I must parent with power. When we define that little word power, all we mean by that is this. You must, power, you must parent with authority. 
The Bible has made it absolutely clear who is supposed to be over the home. The ultimate responsibility lies with whom? Lies with the father, does it not? For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church. Folks, that passage is found in Ephesians 5, verse 25, and it is a strong passage, isn't it? To equal the husband's authority and responsibility over the woman to that of Christ over the church, that is a powerful, powerful position in the home. But beneath that, the mother has power and authority. And you read through the Proverbs, you read such things as this. The instruction of a father. The commandments of a father. And the law of a mother. Proverbs 1.8, Proverbs 6 verse 20. Moms and dads make commandments. Moms and dads make laws. Moms and dads are the individuals who make the rules of the house. And folks, those rules are to be made in many, many areas. In fact, I would say this. There is not an area of that home wherein mom and dad do not have a right to make a rule. That's how much authority they have. Children don't have the right to look at their parents and say, I'm not going to do what you tell me to do. Folks, those parents have a right to make their laws in any area in that home that they so desire. And it is the child's obligation to make dead certain that they submit to the authority of the parent. Deuteronomy or Leviticus 19 verse 3 says this, Thou shalt fear every man, his mother and his father. We talk about the Ten Commandments, don't we? Thou shalt do this, thou shalt not do that. Folks, there's a lot of those found in the pages of the Old Testament. Thou shalt what? Thou shalt fear every man, his mother and his father. The Bible says this, My son, keep the commandment of thy father and forsake not the law of thy mother. Proverbs 6 verse 20. Children, obey your parents in the Lord for this is right. Ephesians 6 verse 1. Parents rule. Parents reign. Parents make laws. And it is the responsibility of the children to submit to that authority. For some reason, that's not done very well anymore in our society. And sadly, it seems as though it starts from a very early age, doesn't it? I'm out in our community and I see parents who let their little toddlers run all over them. Folks, that should never happen. A parent needs to be the one who is in charge at all times. I have the authority, I have the power over my home. Parent with power, folks. But you see, that leads to point number four. Parent with discipline. You see, there's going to come times when children test the limits, aren't they? There's going to come times when children rebel against mom and dad. There are going to become times when a, parent, when a child becomes disobedient. And folks, when those times happen, guess what? A parent must know how to discipline that child. The Bible says foolishness is bound in the heart of a child, but the rod of correction driveth it far from him. Proverbs 22, verse 15. Proverbs 29, verse 15 says this, The rod and reproof give wisdom, but a child left unto himself bringeth his mother to shame. You hear that? The rod and reproof give wisdom. You could call it the board of education. Couldn't you? You see, discipline does at least three things. Number one, it punishes bad behavior. Number two, 
It causes bad behavior to be corrected into good behavior. And number three, it teaches the child what is right, what is wrong, and how he can be rewarded rather than be punished. We act as though this concept of discipline is not a big thing anymore. And yet you go into the pages of God's Word and you look at various men who failed to control their children and folks. The consequences were devastating. Do you know that? The Bible says the sons of Eli were sons of Belial and they knew not God. 1 Samuel 2 verse 12. We turn just one chapter later in chapter 3 and verse 13. And God says this of Eli. For I have told him that I will judge his house for the iniquity which he knoweth. Because his sons made themselves vile, and he restrained them not. Here is a man who will have the high priesthood of the Almighty God ripped from his family. Why? Because he could not control his own children. We turn to 1 Kings chapter 1, verse 5. And we read of a boy by the name of Adonijah, the son of Haggith. And the Bible says that he was going to exalt himself, saying, I will be king. There was only one problem. David was still on the throne. You read the very next verse, and there's an interesting explanation that's given there. The Bible says that David never once said anything to displease his son. Saying, why hast thou done this? Not one time did he try to correct him. Not one time did he confront him. Not one time did he rebuke him. Not one time did he say a word to this rebellious son. And here is a man late in life who almost has his kingdom ripped from him by a rebellious child. Why? All because he didn't control him. Point number five. Folks, we must parent with boundaries, mustn't we? With boundaries. What is a boundary? A boundary is nothing more than a barrier across which something is not to pass. A boundary is something which is set up so that individuals can't come in or go out of it unless authorized. We're facing that problem right here in the United States of America, are we not? We refuse to secure our borders and therefore we continue to have illegal aliens in the United States of America. And folks, if you and I as parents don't set boundaries in our homes, there are definitely going to be problems. And there's all kinds of boundaries that need to be set. I've listed a few in the outline. Emotional boundaries. Parents don't need to get too close to their children, but they don't need to get too distant from their children as well. Children can have problems either way. Children can think that my parents are equal with me or they might think, well, my mom and dad really don't care anything about me. You see, too loose of emotional boundaries cause problems in homes. There are respect boundaries. There are behavior boundaries. There are moral boundaries. There are time and schedule boundaries. On and on and on the list goes. And folks, all of this has to do with disciplining our children, isn't it? We set the boundaries so that they will know how to discipline their lives to be good individuals. Solomon wrote the following in Psalm 10 verse 1. The Proverbs of Solomon. A wise son maketh a glad father. A foolish son is heaviness to his mother. And how true that is. Can you imagine? Just don't set the boundaries. Let them do whatever they want to do. And guess what? At some point, heartache will be ours. Point number six. Parent 
with love. Parent with love. Just a moment ago, it was read in our hearing, Titus chapter 2, verses 1 through 6. In verse 4, I find it interesting that the older women are to teach the younger women the following, to be sober, to love their husbands, watch this, to love their children. When you think about loving your children, there's two big components of that love. Number one, you always look out for the best interest of your child. Now, the child may not think so. I want ice cream. You eat broccoli. Now, see, that don't go. Not with a kid. We are not really looking out for my best interest. Oh, yes, I am. You are not going to the movies this Friday night with that person. Well, you just don't even love me. Oh, yes, I do. Because I'm looking out for what? your best interest. You see, that's the responsibility of parents, to look out for the best interest of their children. If they don't do that, then guess what? There is no way they're showing any love to that child. But secondly, there also must be the component of affection. If you didn't grow up in a very affectionate household, guess what? It's hard to be affectionate, isn't it? The folks, affection's needed. Our children need to be hugged. They need to be touched. They need to be individuals who are told, I love you. By even old grumpy daddy at times. In the outline, I've given a list of ten things wherein parents can show love. And I want you to look at point number one. Point number one says, teach your children the word of God. Folks, if you don't do that, there's no way you love that child. To allow that child to be lost in sin, to allow that child to die and enter into eternal condemnation, how can a parent truly say, I love my child? We live in a world today that is cruel. Do you know that? We live in a world today that is deeply, deeply evil in nature. We live in a world that has a ton of problems. And here's what's interesting. The home is the very basic unit of our society, isn't it? The old adage says, as goes the home, so goes the nation. The old saying says, we are only as strong as our weakest link. And my friends, here's what I'm asking Christian parents to do. Do not let your home be a weak link in the chain. Now the things that I'm asking parents to do are work. They're hard. They're not easy. Especially if you do it every day, day in, on a consistent basis for 18 to 30 years of life. That's a long time, isn't it? It's a long time. It's work. But guess what? Good parenting has wonderful rewards, doesn't it? When you get to be an old man, those children will rise up and give honor to the hoary head, the Bible says, Leviticus 19.32. Here's that virtuous woman who does all she can possibly do for her family, who makes unbelievable sacrifices on their behalf and yet when they're finally grown, the Bible says her children rise up and call her blessed. Proverbs 31, verse 28. Folks, the reality is this. Hard work in the area of parenting pays rich dividends. Folks, make up your mind today. I'm going to be the best parent 
I can possibly be. No, I'm going to be the best parent God wants me to be. Are you a member of the family of God? Maybe you're not. We want you to be. The steps are simple. If you believe in the Christ as the Son of God, will repent of sins, confess the precious name of Jesus, and come and be baptized into Christ, immersed in water, for the forgiveness of your sins, you arise a child in the family of God. The Bible says in Galatians 3, 26 and 27, For you are all children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. For as many of us as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. Won't you do that this morning? Dear Christian, maybe you're erring. Maybe you and your relationship with God the Father have not been walking with Him as did Enoch and Noah. And maybe you need to come back and He, with open arms, will run just as He did to the prodigal son and hug you and He will accept you gladly back into His family. If you need to repent and ask God to forgive you, won't you come as we stand?